Hello everyone, my name is Yara and today I'm going to be doing a review of We Hunt the Flame by Hapsa Faisal. This is a fantasy novel inspired by ancient Arabia and takes place in a country called Arawiya. And Arawiya used to have magic and all people could use magic, but at the time of this novel, magic has long since been eradicated and no one really knows how to use it. However, the cast of characters that we meet are offered an opportunity to find a lost magical item that could end up bringing magic back to the whole country. So we have two perspectives. One is Zafira, who is a girl living in the Caliphate of Demenhor. And Demenhor has been kind of plagued by this force called the Ars that is cursed and anyone who enters it either goes mad or doesn't return. But Sephira finds out from a young age that she can go through the arse without repercussions. And so she uses that opportunity to go hunting and get food for her people. However, the society that she lives in is pretty sexist, so she has to disguise herself as a man to do so. The other perspective we follow is Nasir, who is the crown prince of Arawiya. He is also his father's hitman and assassin. Nasir is the most skilled assassin in this kingdom. He is known as the Prince of Death. But he's kind of conflicted about whether doing his duty is the right way to go or doing what's morally right. Both Zafira and Nasir are instructed to go find this magical item and they meet other people along the way and they pretty much just go on a quest to try and restore magic. I ended up reading this book 2.5 stars, which was really disappointing for me because it was one of my most highly anticipated books of the year. It is an own voices novel by a Muslim Arab author, but my reading experience was not the best to say the least. I'm gonna put this down now because it's getting heavy. This book had the setup to be something that I would absolutely love. It was advertised to me as an Arabian fantasy that had an enemies to lovers romance, had unlikely allies who've been together and found family almost. And while those elements were there, I don't think they were executed nearly as well as they could have been, which was really sad for me. The first thing you'll notice about this book when you read it is that it's really slow paced like sluggishly slow at times. And for the first 100 pages or so, I didn't really mind it because with fantasy novels, the exposition tends to be a little bit more pro prolonged than other novels. And so I was aware of that, I was prepared for that, and I was intrigued by what this world was bringing and the setup of all the conflicts and the quests to come. But at a certain point, I just started getting plain bored. And at first I blamed it on the fact that I was listening to this on an audiobook and I know I should not listen to fantasy in audiobook. I learned in the past that it does not work for me because I just, it's too much information and I can't remember all of it when I hear it. And so it was probably like, maybe like 60% of the way through the book when I realized I really missed so many details. So I decided to reread from like page 100 onward. And that definitely helped with me understanding what was happening a little more and the world and the magic system more. But again, I still ended up feeling really bored. And like I said, theoretically, this book had so many elements that generally please me and I like to see in books. But what I realized as I was reading is that the writing style that the author chose to use really hindered my enjoyment of the novel. It is really, really flowery. It's very purple prose. And sometimes that's really beautiful. Honestly, like it's very beautiful. Like if I were to take excerpts of the book, they are objectively very nice lines. But having a beautiful writing style doesn't always contribute to the story and add impact to it. I honestly feel like the book could be 100 pages shorter because some passages felt like they dragged on or some scenes felt like they dragged on. Like I genuinely remember thinking like, wow, this, we're, we're still here. We haven't moved on yet. <laughs> Honestly, at a certain point, the only thing keeping me going was Altair, who was another member of this group of people on the quest. He is so hilarious. His banter and his wit is just top notch. Loved him. I almost wish there was a little more contrast in the writing style with a mix of straightforward and purple prose because then that would make the moments where we get to sit down and really look introspectively at these characters more impactful in my opinion. And it's so upsetting because I think had not the pace been so slow and the writing kind of dense, I would have really enjoyed these characters a lot more. That's not to say that I didn't care about anything. There were definitely moments where I really felt for what these characters were going through and scenes that really showed their growth and emotions, but those instances were kind of limited. I also didn't like the way that certain action sequences were written. I just felt really confused the whole time as to what was happening. And 
I kept thinking like, it's probably just me. I'm not in the mindset to read this book or I'm not focusing enough, but I read other reviews and other people seem to agree with me. So I think it's not just me. I thought the world building was pretty well done for the most part, specifically in the first half. There are definitely some sections that were kind of info dumpy, but they didn't disrupt the narrative or feel overwhelming in any way. I especially liked learning about the history of the country and the caliphate and the king and all that stuff. I thought that was really well done. It got a little wishy-washy when we started talking about the magic system, which particularly annoyed me. And again, this could have just been me not being fully engaged as I was reading it because it started getting to the points where I was getting bored. But I just felt really confused about a lot of the aspects of the magic system in terms of the limitations and what you can actually do with them and what even is the nature of them. I hope that gets explained further in the sequel, but for now, I am still pretty confused about it. So now let's talk about the romance, which was heavily advertised to me in the marketing for this book. And personally, I was not the biggest fan of it. This could be because of my expectations of what an enemies to lovers romance is. I personally really want to see the emotional development between the two. I want to know why they hate each other and I want to see them grow out of that. In this book, it's kind of like they hate each other, but ooh, they're hot. So I like them. There was definitely a lot of sexual tension that was developed, but because there wasn't any emotional development or little emotional development to supplement that, to me, it kind of felt weak and I just didn't believe it. <laughs> Honestly, for a lot of aspects of this novel, I like where we started and I like where we ended, but I didn't like the way to get there. I didn't like the journey or at least how it was executed. I did end up enjoying the last few chapters of the novel. And even though I had some issues with the way the action sequences were executed, a lot of what actually happened was pretty interesting and it set up for a good sequel, I hope. And that's why I do intend to read the sequel. Now, as an Arab person, I feel the need to comment on the representation in this book. And I have mixed feelings about that too. So this book includes a lot of aspects of Arab culture, like the food and the language. And honestly, my favorite part about that was the food because I don't know, because it just feels good to see food that I consider normal, my family considers normal, but to people who aren't Arab would not seem pretty normal, just like in that book. I was really excited to learn that there would be Arabic in this book because my family speaks Arabic and I thought that'd be really cool. But I don't think it was done in the best way. Like there are a lot of instances where it felt awkward or just not properly used. Some I didn't really mind because this is a fantasy, so there is some artistic liberty involved. Like for example, Zafira uses the word dama a lot, which means bloody, like in the sense like every bloody day, something like that, every dama day, which like I haven't heard used before, but also this is a fantasy, so I can give some artistic liberty to it. Another one that kind of irked me was the use of the word khara, which means shit. And the author would use that in situations like, shit, I messed up, like khara, I messed up. But like, you wouldn't use khara in that sense, at least I've never heard it used that way. It's more of like phrases that involve like poop, like referencing poop. <laughs> I'll just give one more example because this annoyed me. But the fact that Zafira called her dad Baba and then her mom Um. Baba translates to dad and Um translates to mother. So technically it's not like incorrect. I was just like, if you called your dad Baba, why don't you call your mom, mama? And mama is just a more common term. Like I don't really hear people refer to their mom when they're like speaking to them as um. You would say when you were referring to the mother of someone like um yara, so mother of yara. I don't know. I'm not personally fluent in Arabic, but I do know enough. And I also ask people who are fluent in Arabic in my family, what their opinion was on the use of the language and they agreed with me that it was kind of strange. And honestly, that really surprised me because this author, I'm pretty sure, is of Arab descent, so... <laughs> I don't know. It's probably not that big of a deal if you don't know Arabic, but <laughs> it's just something that I noticed. But also that could just be my experience with the language and my dialect, the Syrian dialect in general, as opposed to other parts of the world. So if you had a different experience with the Arabic, please let me know. So overall, I thought there was a lot of good elements that were laid out and it had a lot of potential, but I think the writing style really hindered the execution. Even though I was kind of disappointed, I don't regret buying this book because this cover is freaking beautiful. Like, look at that. 
that's that's just beautiful and I will be checking out the next book in the series. I definitely want to support more Arab Muslim authors. And also, I think maybe if I go into the next book with the mindset of what this writing style is going to be and letting myself take my time with it, I will maybe enjoy it more, hopefully. So now I just want to discuss a few spoilery things. Probably not too long, but if you haven't read the book, please leave. So spoilers starting. Now, I just really wanted to mention how similar this book is to The Hunger Games, especially in like the first 100 pages. You have a teenage girl who is really skilled with a bow. You have a dad who died a few years before the novel starts and who taught the girl how to hunt. You have a mom who is not really there and who the main character doesn't have a good relationship with at the start of the novel. You have the mother and the sister who are both healers and a main character who was living in the district slash caliphate that has the worst conditions in the country. <laughs> you also even have a Gale character with Dean, but I like Dean a lot more than Gale, to be quite honest. It's so strange how close it is. It's really strange. Let's talk about Dean, because I feel like no one talks about Dean when I read reviews. So I fell in love with Dean from like the minute we saw him. I don't know, he was so cute, he was nice. I'm a sucker for friends to lovers, so I was really excited when I saw him and he was really supportive and they kind of had their little angsty moments. But I knew this book was enemies to lovers, so I'm like, what's, wh wh where's Dean gonna go? Like, is there gonna be a love triangle? If there is, why did no one talk about the love triangle? Why did no one mention Dean in their reviews? And then it hit me. <laughs> Dean's gonna die. And lo and behold, Dean dies. Honestly, it was kind of quick. And I would have been more mad about that, but the effect of his death was present throughout the rest of the novel, which I really did appreciate, so that I was okay with. Probably my favorite scene of the book was when Altair was explaining what happened and why he shot the arrow. I was having a hard time getting emotionally invested in the story, but then this scene really, I felt the impact of it. The whole situation just kind of really hurts because one, Dean died, and he was innocent and pure and deserved to live longer. And two, because Altair is really genuinely hurt by it because he knew Dean and he knew he was innocent, but it was like a mistake of the arrow. And I like that Zafir got so mad because it's like, yeah, your mistake cost Dean his life. I'm still really confused at the magic. Like I literally, I could not tell you what blood magic is, like them sihid. I think that's how you say it, I don't know. It's hard when it's like Arabic, but it's written in English, so I can't tell what it's supposed to be sometimes. Or like the affinities, like that one I kind of understood, like her affinity is like tracking or like finding things, or like being drawn to the magic or something. And then Nasir's is darkness, and then Altair's is light, and then Kifa is like a mirage There's also like Benjamin with his whole dream things, and I'm not gonna fault the book for this. I think I was generally just not paying attention to the details about how all this worked, but I, I'm a confused bean, okay? What else can I talk about? Benjamin's death was also a scene that I felt the emotion by, but I think it was more because of the voice actor in the audiobook. Like, he did that scene really well. Like, he acted out Altair's sadness so well, so then I was sad, I was like, oh my god. I still don't really understand exactly what happened. Maybe at the time when I did, it's been like two weeks since I read the book at this point. The only reveal that I really saw coming was the line of the night being Altair's dad. Cause I thought that reveal was coming before when Zafira first got caught by the lion and you see Altair and I thought we were gonna find out that he was working for him or he was related to him or something. Or I guess I didn't know if he was gonna be his son, but I knew he was on that side. And so finding out that he was his son, I was like, okay, that makes sense. I didn't really guess that the Silver Witch was one of the six sisters, but I also was like, that makes sense. But I didn't guess that she was Nasir's mom. I also didn't guess that Nasir and Altair were gonna be brothers. That twist I liked, because that adds like a whole new dynamic to the story, which I'm excited to explore. I don't know how much of this is going to be in the next book, but I really like that the epilogue was from Yasmin's perspective. That's her name, right? I liked how it showed 
what she was going through for a little bit. And then we see from Altair's perspective too, like I guess I'm just tired of Zafira and Nasir. Like I wanted to see the other people too. This might be an easily answerable question, but Zafira became the hunter because the Ars made their land like snowed and they weren't prepared for that lifestyle so she needed to provide them with food or else they were gonna starve or something, I think. And so because Safira could go into the Ars, she became a hunter to provide them with food. But then when Zafira was gonna go leave for the Shard, the Caliph was like, no, it's okay, we'll take care, we'll provide food for the people on the west side of Demon Horse, whatever side it was. And like, if you had the means, why did you not do it before? What was the point of Zephyr being the huntress? Oh, another twist I liked was that the daughter of the Caliph was being secretly raised to be the next Khalifa. I liked that, especially relating to Zephyr's impact in showing the world that she was a huntress. Something else that didn't really make sense to me was when Zephyra was invited or told to go to Shar, um, they were like, only Zephyra can go because she was the only one invited by the Silver Witch. But then Dean is like, well, I'm the only one who's loyal to Zephyra. And they're just like, okay, he can go. But then by that logic, why don't more people go? <sighs> like, I feel like they should have sent reinforcements with her then or something. I don't know. I feel like it just added so much drama to that scene. That scene took so much time. It was like multiple chapters. And I was like, we're still here. We're, we're still here. Like, I feel like if you just told me what happened, like, the content is fine. But it just felt so long. <laughs> Going back to the enemies to lovers romance thing, I definitely understood why Zafira hated Nasir because even when she found out that he wasn't the one that killed Dean, he's still, like, an assassin and, like, the son of, like, the worst man. <laughs> It may be because Nasir didn't really hate Zafira that I didn't really feel like an enemies to lovers. But I think it's more so the fact that Zafira didn't really like talk to him that much. I guess she learned about his scars and how he was treated. So that kind of gave her more insight to his character. But I still feel like they should have had more talking to each other, airing out their grievances their stories, their feelings, you know, before they're like together. And granted, they're not together at the end. They just kissed. There's still more development to come. So maybe I'll like the next one more. Who knows? Anyways, I think that's all I have to say. Thank you so much for watching. Please let me know what you thought of this book. If you agreed with me or you've disagreed with me, please comment down below and I'll see you next time. Bye.